Okay, so I am going to talk about what is the action plan we are proposing for trade and for coming markets. The, the idea behind and the concept behind is that we have prices going up substantially and even going farther up than what fundamentals are telling us. So we're, we're trying to find measures to be able to calm markets and to become and come down to what the fundamentals are telling us. So what, what I am going to present is basically three points. The first one is to eliminate agriculture export bans and export restrictions, given they have had an impact over the price increases in the last months. Calm markets with the use of market-oriented regulation, and also to policies to complete the Doha round of World Trade Organization negotiations. On the first one, on elimination of export bans, we have seen in the last months, several countries have implemented export bans, export taxes, and export quantitative restrictions for selected products, which create an impact over the prices. So again, it's creating an impact over what the fundamentals will be saying. For example, we have in Argentina, there were taxes to exports of soy, soybeans, in Cambodia, China, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Malaysia, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Russia, Vietnam, Zambia, and Serbia. As a result of those, of those bans, there is a constraint over the, over the supply of the product that is being exported and the, therefore the product that is being traded, and of course that creates more pressure over the markets, increasing the prices. Simulations on, on, on the major bans imposed with the Mirage model, a general equilibrium model, country worldwide general equilibrium model, show that this could be explaining around 30% of the current price increases in the last months. Now, why is this very important? It's very important because we are in a very co highly concentrated market, especially for the commodities in question, rice, wheat, maize, and soy. This map just shows the traditional IC5 index, the index of concentration of the five top exporting countries. So the red means that you are between the first and the fifth country in the share of exports of the total world exports. Orange, six and 10, yellow, 11 and 15, lighter yellow, 16 and 20, and green, bigger than 20. As you can see, the first top five exporting countries are the US, Korea, Japan, Thailand, and China. In rice, for example, this accounts for around 80 something percent of the exports. Therefore, any change in any of these country policies, export policies, will have a significant impact over the prices because they share a big part of the exports. Of course, you will tell me, okay, some countries export and import, but if you look to the export minus import, the picture is even worse. You have fewer countries that share most of the net export in the world. So any change in trade barriers in these countries will immediately have an effect over prices. So what we are proposing and how? The problem is that export bans cannot be addressed country by country. They have to be addressed globally. But this cannot be added to the WTO. So what we are saying is that this should be addressed by an ad hoc forum of global players negotiating according to a code of conduct and in a spirit of mutual building. But this has to be with the major exporting countries to avoid this effect over prices. So at the very least, export rate for humanitarian purposes should be reopened now, even if before the forum is convened. So what could be expected from these measures? It will stabilize the grain price fluctuations. It will reduce price levels by as much as 30% as we have simulated. Enhance efficiency of agricultural production. Who will be the key actors? The G plus eight plus the five and sub-regional organizations. And where is the action? The action is more relevant. It will be mainly on the countries which control the major exports. There are, in, there are already some actions in some regions that are trying to create uh, uh, some coordination about this topic, but the idea here is to basically focus on the major countries behind the, the exports, the major shares of exports. Now, the second component is how to use uh, market-oriented regulation to try to calm markets. As we know, and this has been explained several times by several stakeholders at this point, there is the fundamentals, what we call the supply and demand effects over the prices. But there is also the rising expectations of this market, and there is the market behavior, component of which is speculation and hoarding. Now, it's very difficult to be able to disentangle what is expectations from what is speculation and what is hoarding. That is very complex, and I am not going to give the answer today. But basically, what we know is that there is an increase in 2007 of the volume of global traded grain futures and options by 33 and 48% from the Chicago Board of Trade. So governments are increasingly curb hoarding, like India, and Pakistan, and Philippines. So this will have an impact, of course, over price, because it's pressuring, again, the demand, and this will create an effect over prices. Now, commodity exchanges are supposed to come to, to, to order and to calmly and make the markets to work efficiently. But we need to be careful in what is going on in the markets. Now, if we look to the, to the future trades in corn, for example, we see over the time that there is an increase, and this will continue growing over time. 
But this again is just telling that there is a dynamic market happening and people are acting, entering this new market, which is a market profitable at this point because of the variability and how concentrated is the market. But if we try to do a little bit, um, a, a bigger effort and try to understand who are trading in this market and we split for the same case of corn, what are the commercial versus the non-commercial transactions? Where non-commercial are the people which normally were not trading in this sector. In the commercial case, you will have all the regular traders, the big traders that were working in futures in this market. We see that there is an increase in the trend or in the proportion of transactions done by non-commercial traders, which means that this market has become a more attractive market for people like you and me. So it's a market where we can invest now and we can have some profit because it's a concentrated market and therefore there will be variations in the market. So that is not telling us that this is speculation, of course. It's telling us that there is something else going on and we are doing research in trying to identify how much of that could be speculation or not. For that, we need to know the size of the durations of the contracts, if they are short or if they are long, and do many other tests to be able to argue that this is fully speculation. Now, what to do to try to minimize this problem that the markets are not calm and you are living like in a kind of a hyperinflation. So if you have hyperinflation, relative prices are not appropriate, so uh, are not aligned appropriately. So we need to do something to be able to help that, this to, to solve and to come down to what we were calling, or what we know the fundamentals are telling the supply and demand. The first policy that we are trying to propose is a coordinate set of pledges for a modest grain reserve to be made by the main grain producing countries, which should be estab established at a global or regional level. This doesn't mean, of course, that we need to have grains stored in some place. This means a coordination, and it also means that we have to look to innovative ways to do it. Modern central banks doesn't have the gold stored. The gold is invested somewhere. So we have to find a way to be able to have this uh, uh, coordination of the, of the reserves so that they can play a role when we have these spikes, which is creating this distortion in the market, which is not necessarily what fundamentals are telling. So a global intelligence network should be put in place to be able to react and to help this coordination so that you can react when the market is not telling exactly what the supply and demand is, is supposed to be saying. The Food Aid Convention should be renegotiated and reformed, while current grain delivery and cash com commitments should be expanded. An accompanying option could be a finance facility provided by the International Monetary Fund, which was already discussed in the previous price crisis in the 70s, for imports by countries in food emergencies. But again, this needs to be carefully thought because we don't want to put more pressure over the prices. So we need to have mechanisms in place to avoid that this will help to create more pressure over the demand. So what could be expected from these measures is access to food supplies for countries with deficits, help contain the speculative expectations, costs and benefits need to be carefully weighted. Who will be the key actors? The IMF, the OECD countries, sub-regional organizations and commodity exchanges. We are against radical measures over commodity exchanges. We think the future market should be open, but this type of market or interregulation should be put in place. Where is the action more relevant in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa and Middle East? It's important to mention that several countries are trying to do regional coordination of supplies of stocks at this point. But we need to be treated very carefully because a global, what we are proposing is a global coordination for the major stakeholders, but regional, sub-regional coordination is difficult. It could open windows for corruption. It could open windows for many problems that will happen if one country doesn't comply with what they had agreed. Like in Central America, they're trying to make a coordination. So what happens if Nicaragua doesn't agree when Honduras wants to deploy the, the black beans uh, uh, supplies? So it's very, very important to, to be very careful in, in what these, these measures mean and how carefully you need to research about it and to be able to implement them. And the final point I wanted to bring up is the WTO negotiations and how important they are. Although it's the last topic I'm going to talk about, I think is one of the most important because in a period where we have a short in supply, it's very important to open all options of trade and not to reduce them. It should be easier for countries to agree to lower agricultural tariffs with market prices, especially for sensitive commodities, which are high. The EU has already eliminated the supply tariffs on cereals, but it has not yet decreased its bound tariffs, which means that there is no certainty about these levels in the long term. Major problem is that the policymakers in developed countries want to keep their options open in case of prices fall. So here is where the pressure has to come up. As a farmer, I don't want to close an option that I have a support price if the price internationally will fall over time. But here is where the Doha could play a role and where we have to push to open the trades. So the current price situation should be viewed as an opportunity and not as a rejection to what the Doha negotiations should do. So what could be expected from these measures? They will lead to more fair and open trade, more efficient resource use, and higher welfare for people in developing countries. Who will be the key actors? The WTO and the OECD countries. And the action is more relevant, of course, at the global level, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America.